to Monster Mondays. I'm your host, Smiley Monster. And if you're having a down day, I am here to make it pink. I have updates, fun activities, and a chat with one of the artists of our special games NFTs. Please subscribe to our channel. And if you like this video, please click the thumbs up button and come chat with me in the comment section. If you're watching this live, I am over there chatting, listening, and smiling. Now this episode would not be possible without our sponsor. Our sponsor of the week is K7 Classic Comms. Are you tired of getting wrecked by rug pulls? Sick of those Elon Musk moon tweets that are causing you more heartburn than last night's ramen? Fear not, fellow DeFi DGENs. Introducing the revolutionary K7 Classic Com Suite, the ultimate back to basics communication tool for the crypto fatigued soul. I mean, ditch the Discord drama. Forget the endless FUD and shilling in those chat rooms. Pencil a heartfelt letter to your favorite project founder expressing your unwavering support, or lack thereof. They'll surely appreciate the snail mail pace compared to the usual Twitter tantrums. Forget the fishing phantoms. No more sketchy DMs props promising you unimaginable wealth. With your trusty pen and paper, the only keys you'll need are the ones to unlock your mailbox. Tired of gas fees get you dropping? Save those precious sats by ditching the blockchain altogether. <gasps> Send signals to your crypto buddies across the plains. Carrier pigeon rental not included. The K7 Classic Com Suite, because sometimes low tech is the best tech. It includes one vintage rotary phone, batteries not included, perfect for those cold calling customer service experiences we all know and love. A lifetime supply of carrier pigeon food, optional for the truly adventurous, and a dusty cannon string, because sometimes the simplest solutions are the best. Limited supply available. Order yours today and receive a complimentary tin foil hat to further protect yourself from those pesky conspiracy theories. K7 Classic Comms. When the future feels too uncertain, embrace the nostalgia. Disclaimer, K7 Classic Comms not liable for missed investment of opportunities due to delayed communication. Actual results may vary. Thanks, K7. We appreciate your sponsorship. All right, crypto fam, strap on your gear belt because we are facing off with the history of comic books with a little Web3 twist, of course. Now, you wouldn't believe it, but capes and tights have been delivering messages for almost 100 years. Back in the day, the 30s and 40s were all about escapism. Think Superman saving the day during the Great Depression or Captain America punching Nazis in World War II. Comics were pure fun, kind of like that feeling when you snag a rare NFT after refreshing for hours. And then came the 50s and the Comics Code Authority. So this was basically the fun police enforcing these strict rules that made everything squeaky clean. Imagine a world where Wolverine couldn't even adamantium claw his way out of a jam. Boring, right? So thankfully, things loosened up in the 60s with space exploration and Flash Gordon blasting off. And then the 70s and 80s got real. We're talking gritty storylines, social commentary, and even some horror thrown in for good measure. Think Watchmen, a dark comic that had, it was like a closed Discord channel during a bear market, right? Anti-heroes rose to prominence like Wolverine. He wasn't afraid to get his claws dirty, kind of like some tactics in the DeFi space. And the 90s saw diversity take center stage. You had Black Panther, Ms. Marvel, finally heroes who reflected the real world, not just some idealized version. And let's not forget the rise of independent creators, proving that you didn't need a giant corporation to tell a killer story. So this whole creator ownership movement in comics, doesn't that feel very Web 3? So think of today. Now, comics are this totally wild mix of reboots, genre mashups, independent voices, amazing art. But here's the thing. Web3 is going to totally rewrite this story again. See, using blockchain, blockchain technology and things like NFTs, comics can be created, distributed, and experienced in a totally different way. Imagine you own a digital comic 
that you don't just read, but you can participate in. We're talking about voting on plot points or even co-creating stories with the writers themselves. That's community ownership. Web3 can be a total game changer for independent creators, diverse voices. You don't have these gatekeepers of traditional publishing. With Web3, creators can reach audiences directly and also monetize their work on their own terms. And that can lead to a whole new wave of innovative stories and characters that we haven't even imagined yet. Okay, but it's not all okay, rainbows and unicorns. There can be some problems with it, right? Tech can be confusing. There's this risk also that really only crypto natives are going to be able to access these new comics. I mean, we know that the bar is high to get into crypto to begin with. We also have to watch out for speculation, driving prices through the roof, making comics like exclusive just for the wealthy. And we also have a lot of concern for the environmental impact on blockchain technology, right? We don't want our favorite heroes saving the day while leaving this giant carbon footprint behind, right? And there is the risk of big corporations jumping in and using Web3 just to market that same old tired character instead of embracing innovation. So Web3 presents exciting opportunities, but also challenges. But it'll be really cool to see how things going. I mean, the future of comics is wide open right now. That's anything but boring. So I have a little comics trivia for you. I'm going to sprinkle it throughout the episode. Here's the first one. Let's see if you can tell me in the chat. Write down your answers. Think about this. Let's see who can be first. What is the real name of the vigilante known as Moon Knight in the Marvel Universe? Come on, guys. You guys know this. Moon Knight was actually made into a TV show. You, if you know me, you know that I always say the laters. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. The answer is Stephen Grant. Okay. Next one. Who is the first superhero to be on the cover of Action Comics number one in 1938? Oh my gosh, we're going really back far. You guys should know this if you are a comic book enthusiast, though. This is like the number one trivia question you should know the answer to. Give up? No, you guys know this, right? It's Superman. Okay, moving on here. It's time for Monstro Moolah Madness. Okay, guys, let's take a look at the past week. Are these earnings going to be the hero we need or the villain we fear? Are you ready for this financial showdown? Okay, our 34th weekly payout this past week was made up of all earnings from Wednesday, April 3rd through Tuesday, April 9th. Payouts are in USDC on the BNB Smart Chain. And yes, they included both the Lazarus Pit bonuses and Cycle D bonuses. Okay, I'm going to do this fast again like last week. <laughs> Here I go. Period earnings, $33,699.15 to 1,020 recipients, which was an increase of 11. Holders were $30,556.17 USDC, which was 90.71%, and to the team treasury was 10.29%. The ROI tracker not including any Lazarus Pit bonuses. Genesis up 1.45%. Cycle B up 1.45%. Cycle C and Spooky up 145%. <laughs> Cycle B up 1.61%. Cycle E up 1.45%. And DGEN's Phase 2 and Games got $1.81 USDC per unit. Remember, Cycle D includes the bonus share from Cycle E sales. We had 41 of those just that past week. And Cycle B has finally ROI'd. Oh, dude, we got to totally clap for that. And that was Monstro Mula Madness. Moving on, guys, let's have a little more trivia. You ready? Get ready to type your answers in the comments. Okay, in DC comment, Comics, what is the name of the metal that weakens Superman? You guys should all know this. Okay, I see somebody's got to get this. The answer is kryptonite. Next question. Who is the current wielder of Mjolnir, Thoris Hamill, in Marvel, Marvel Comics? Somebody give me the answer to that. It's probably not who you're thinking. Give up, guys. Okay, 
it is Jane Foster. If you watch the movies, you can see that. This is interesting because sometimes you'll see the comics and the movies will diverge and sometimes they both share the same story. So tell me, what have you seen? What have you read? Any comic fans, any just movie fans of Thor? Time for Token Tingles. Good morning and welcome to Token Tingles. This is an exciting episode because we finally reached the 12 week point. Welcome V, how are you today? Hey, exhausted and I think I lost, so <laughs> not a good Saturday. <laughs> well, let's see how everybody did. So let's put it up here. We have team V, Teddy Bear was down 31.62%. Win was down 81.73%. AKT is up 38.28%. Rose is up 3.44%. 2CC is down 38.10%. File is up 1.49%. Crazy Bunny is down 87.41%. Portal's down 48.02%. GME is down 53.55%. Desync is up 112.70% and Solana is, oh, that should say up 6.99%. So how do you feel? What's your critique or review of it? The meme coin screwed me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Moving on to Team Smiley. Factory had this ginormous god candle this week, which popped it to 617.79% up. You bought it all, didn't you, to win this competition? <laughs> it looks that way, doesn't it? It's, it was like one big buy. Um, Ape is up. Ape went up 17.28%. XNL is up 55.41%. Walk-in is up 22.38%. PBX is down 4.20%. Myria is down 28.06%. RVF is down 29.09%. OPSEC is down 16.75%. Demetra is up 30.42%. Beefy is up 14.70%. And TD or Big Red, it was up 50.54% for an average up of 66.40%. Well, I think congratulations because Factory led you to victory. <laughs> it did, which makes me happy. I mean, it's not really anything I did, but the team over there has been working so hard, and I know they really want to make this work, and they're just developing and developing. So I'm really happy for them. You know, especially. Mm -hmm. and oh, then, I noticed oh, you yeah. have a different outfit today. <laughs> I do. It was supposed to be a Batman logo, and it turned <laughs> out like this. So I went with it. <laughs> and then Team Guest, this is how they did. AJ's Goat was down 22.16%. Nate's Wooly is down, sorry, Nate, 88.32%. Ben Sharks was the second ranker at up 277.43%. Coach's Slayer is up 51.77%. Madi's Riva is up 42.14%. Pelton and Pockets BioFi is up 1.48%. JP's IOC is up 2.17%. And then Oxjo had picked Link. That is up 3.49% for an average of 24.35%. Not bad. That looks like a fun name for a show, Pelton and Pocket. Yes, <laughs> the P <pea> guys. <laughs> or maybe oh, not. <laughs> that could be something different. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so if you stay tuned next week, you will find out what terribly embarrassing thing I'm going to do to me. <laughs> <laughs> damn you, Drake. Damn you, Teddy Bear. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's a lesson to be learned in this, you know, because mm -hmm. you are brilliant at picking what to invest in for farming for monstros because that makes sense. But sometimes meme coins make no sense at all and then they pump and they go crazy and you can't always predict it. Yeah, I think these memes, the ones we picked show, sometimes they were up big and then the next week they were down big. So you got to get rid of them pretty quick. Um, yes. 
Whereas the utility ones over time have proven out they actually hold their value better. So if you're, you know, investing for the long term, you can go with those. And if you're investing for fun and for the short term, you can you can play the memes, but it really is like just playing, you know, the casino or the lottery. So true. And that is our special lesson today on Token yeah. Tingles. Thanks, V. And by the time you're seeing this, though, everything might be much worse than it looks like because <laughs> altcoins are taking a beating after yesterday. Um, I'm not sure when you recorded the numbers, but we had pretty much every altcoin drop 20 to 50% yesterday. <laughs> wow. Well, that's a good thing I did it on Friday. <laughs> yeah, no, this is Friday. This just happened. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you might have you might have got them in before the crash. <laughs> there you go. That was my secret strategy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank right. you. See Enjoy you next week. Enjoy the rest week. of your Monday. Okay. Bye. It's time to announce Monster of the Week. And this is a special person that is just supportive and encouraging in the community. And I'm very happy to announce that this week, our Monster of the Week is Arg, <laughs> yes, you heard that right. A R G H H H H exclamation point. We're going to shine our spotlight this week on our own creative monster, the caretaker of Ribbity Rose, and a true monstro enthusiast, Arg. And here's why he deserves the title. He isn't just a vault holder, but he's an artist. And he always shares these awesome monster themed picks that are just pure fire. They bring our monsters to life in a whole new way. And they're just fun. We enjoy them. He's also the question master. He never shies away from a good question. He keeps the conversation flowing in the chats. He asks insightful questions about the protocol. And he's always curious to learn more. He's also a familiar face in the chats. He's always happy to lend a helping paw and answer questions from fellow vault holders. I mean, knowledge is power, guys. And he brings a positive and playful energy to the community. So we all want to raise a tankard of grog to Arg, our monster of the week. Let's hear it for his creativity, his inquisitiveness, and dedication to the Monstro community. And hey, if you want to connect with him, look for him in the chats. And don't be for, uh, shy to say hi. He's always there and he's always happy to say hi to everybody. Okay, I have a couple more last two trivia questions for you. Are you ready? Okay, head on over to the chat. And let's see if you can answer these last two. First one, what is the name of the sentient planet that is a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy? This one, I did not know, to be honest myself, guys. So I'm really impressed if you know the answer to this one. Okay, what did you guys all write? I hope you wrote Groot. Did you realize he was a sentient planet? That is interesting. And last trivia question. Which comic book company launched the popular Invincible series? Oh, guys, dude, if you have not read this, such a great series. Totally worth a read. Which comic book company launched that? Good for them. Okay, let's see what your answers are. Did anybody say Image Comics? You are right. Okay, it is time now for my special guest, artist Mark McKenna. This is my pleasure. Hello, monsters. My special guest this week is Mark McKenna, and this is straight from his website. He has been a comic book artist for 32 years, having worked for both Marvel and DC Comics on X-Men, Spider-Man, Batman, Justice League, and more. There are almost 600 comics with his name in the credits and 12,000 pages that bear his ink lines on them. Welcome, Mr. McKenna. Hey there. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. We really enjoy all of your artwork, especially on our new NFTs that we have in Monstro. And so it's very exciting to meet you and get to know you better. Thank you. Thank you. So I always like to start with a little word association game. Are you up for a game? Sure, let's go. Okay. Just say the first word that comes to your mind and don't overthink it. Ink. Lot. <laughs> 
Vigilante. The killer. Ooh. Gurgle Sklitch. Uh, Gerber. Dynamic. Uh, tension. Hmm. Noir. Black and white or black. Superhuman. Powers. Ooh. Enigmatic. Quiet. Multiverse. Doctor Strange. Ooh. Cybernetic. Terminator. And Arcane. Devil. Congratulations. You are the first person to actually do that as fast as you have. Most people want to think about it and give me a nice long answer, which is <laughs> fine. But wow, I appreciate you doing that. Sure. So first, I would love if you just tell us a little bit about your website. And I have it here. I just want to run it on the bottom of the screen. What can people find here about you? So it's a, a little bit of a history lesson, I think. Maybe there might be a I don't go to my own website a lot, but um, th th there, there's a, a store, I believe, in there if you want to buy art prints uh, that I, I worked on that were either in print at Marvel or DC or just commissions that came out really nice. Uh, appearances is a calendar for my appearances. And um, uh, when I run uh, crowdfunding like Indiegogo or Kickstarter, sometimes I promote it on the website there. Excellent. And I need to ask you if this is okay. I was looking on there and I saw a lithograph for the show Gargoyles. I love that show. It was such an awesome show. Did you work on that? No, actually, uh, that is a common question with uh, for people. They ask if I worked on that. Uh, I did not work on it, but my kids grew up with it. And um, we used to have the action figures. And um, I just was looking for more product that was more catered towards um, younger kids, um, you know, because you could do a lot of superheroes and monsters and stuff. But then I, I you know, I don't want to forego little kids when they come by my table at, you know, conventions and, uh, you know, want to look at stuff. I have some gargoyles. I had um, some Power Rangers, things like that. Love Power Rangers, too. <laughs> so which came first, your love for comics or art? That's a good one. I, when I was seven or eight years old, I used to draw um, soldiers and parachutes and tanks and stuff like that. And I tried to draw Frankenstein and, you know, the mummy and stuff like that. So I think at my earliest, and this is a good question, I really don't get to ask this, um, that I probably like to doodle first. I, mean, I think my mom was pretty talented with art. But oh. it's, it was when I uh, had to decide on a future when I was in high school. And I met with the guidance counselor and he said, you know, what do you want to do? For the rest of your life and at that point i was making super eight movies and i was oh. uh, collecting comics and mm -hmm. i was thinking about going to film school and i went to the school of visual arts in new york city and i met with the film chairman and the guy told me there's a chance the chances of me getting a job in film were astronomical he said like ten thousand oh. to one and what i what he wanted me to do is have intestinal fortitude and say i'm going to do it i can do it you know <laughs> I was scared because I had no history with it. Mm -hmm. And I said, let me go into animation. So that's comics and movies a little bit. So I was an animation major for my two, first two years in college. And then from there, I everything was hand drawn back in the early 80s. There was no computers there. So uh, I it was 770 drawings for one minute of animation. And I was losing my wow. mind. So I, I ended up meeting with the... Um, the illustration uh, chair and I went over and I started doing comic book stuff from there and one of the guys who was a teacher at visual arts where I graduated was also the Newtown coordinator at DC Comics so when I met him he brought me up to the offices at DC and from there I just it, it sort of fell in place for me it sounds like that was an easy transition because it was a lot less work so how did you then get into web 3 and designing art for that um for the crypto business yes what do you say okay um i was doing i did i worked on some star wars projects for dark horse comics before disney bought Mar you know disney marvel and star wars all got together back in the uh early 2000s 
Dark Horse Comics, which was a smaller publisher, had the rights to uh, Star Wars. So I got to do a couple of these Old Republic miniseries, one called The Lost Sons and another one called uh, Blood of the Empire. And um, the uh, guys at, Make at Maker's Place, which is one of the crypto platforms um, or NFT platforms, uh, asked me if I would be their branded Star Wars uh, artist. And I said, sure, I, I would, that would be fine. So I started doing Darth Vader stuff with Baby Yoda. Um, I did an unemployment line with a bunch of third, you know, second generation characters that just, you know, waiting on line for unemployment. And it was also trying to be topical for whatever was going on in the world at that time, you know, and COVID happened and people were out of work and stuff was weird. But I didn't realize when I was doing the Star Wars stuff that <laughs> Maker's Place didn't have the license to uh, uh -oh. Star Wars. Yeah, I know. It got a little ugly there. So I had no idea when I'm doing this. I'm figuring they're a big company. They must have got the rights. And um, now I only do uh, public domain stuff for my own characters. So I did uh, Alice in Wonderland as public domain because it's very old. Uh, Wizard of Oz, mythological characters. You can do all that stuff. So I got away from Star Wars. I started doing things that were more pu public in a public uh, public's mind. Now, how have superheroes changed from when you first started designing and drawing comics to now? As society has changed so much, how has the role of superheroes changed? Well, it used to be very simple, right? Um, back then. Um, they didn't get deep, they didn't get into the psychological, you know, characterization of the characters. So, uh, you know, with, I mean, Stan Lee, when he did Spider-Man, you know, and brought that stuff, you know, if he had a cold, he, you know, Spider-Man had a cold. You never see Superman or Batman have a cold, you know, it's just, right. they're out there just fighting the bad guys. Um, so he started to bring a little more um, dimension to the characters. But, and of course, over time, that's changed. And, uh, it's hard to tell a story in a like, 22 page comic. So they make these, you know, these make these big uh, mini series or maxi series. And, you know, they, they delve a lot deeper into the characters than they did back when it was just uh, disposable reading stuff, you know? Right. Have you ever created a character that you've wanted to become where you just wanted to step into his identity? You know, uh, it, uh, it was funny. I, when I was, uh, I guess, around the preteen or around the early teen, I was, I was, uh, I wanted to be. I, I was reading Archie comics at the time, mm -hmm. and I, was, I thought it'd be, a, it'd be, it'd be a fun to be an Archie character and have Betty and Veronica all excited about hanging out with me, you know. <laughs> but um, uh, as far as other, other than that, nothing really, nothing more than that, though. Okay, so. Do you have a special key ingredient, though, to making a character seem memorable or more lifelike? Uh, so I've done a, I've, the, the thing about me doing work for Marvel and DC was I don't own anything, right? I, you work for hire with all these characters and stuff. So when uh, the business changed a little bit and I became a little older and a little more expensive to to hire, they start getting a lot of um, international talent to do the work because it, now the World Wide Web is legitimately a World Wide Web. It's not, you can't just, you, you know, you could scan artwork from Brazil or Puerto Rico and then they'd have it in their hands in five seconds. Right. Um, but uh, so I started creating my own characters that I would know I would own myself. But what I was trying to do is bring my Marvel and DC you know, people recognize my name from Marvel and DC, you know, and um, that allowed me to delve into my own characters and do stuff that I kind of grew up liking, like a horror books. Um, there was a series back in the 50s called the Tales of, uh, there was a vault of horror and Tales of the Crypt. They were horror stories, but they were short stories, you know. So I created this uh, Tomb of Balbarith, which is a, which is a, a, a demon character who's in suspended animation. And um, he has a demon jester sidekick who, cre who releases monsters on humanity to, to collect body parts to feed his master, you know? So there's brains, hearts, and souls. So he reached these. So I had these uh, friends, all guys who wanted to be comic creators, 
they all, um, I said, listen, write up your own stories and I'll publish it because people know who I am and I'm getting into diamond distribution and it could be, you know, we could do something with it, you know? So I raised right. like eight, seven, eight thousand dollars and we did that. And, um, but there's something very rewarding about having your own characters. I mean, it's Spider-Man and Batman paid the bills, but then you're now you're allowed to go do your own characters and hopefully bring some of that love back. You know, so That's I did so a monkey, I did my monkey book called Banana Tail for my children. I, don't know <laughs> I, don't I saw know. that on the website. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, I'll, when we're done, I'll send you some stuff. But um, oh, thank you. When my kids were four newborn is when I did that stuff, and uh, my my daughter had an operation on her throat to remove a cyst uh, oh. from her throat, and I remember she was four years old. And as soon as she got the um, the IV taken out, and we left the hospital, took her right to Toys R Us. It said, you could have whatever you want in the store. Wow. Yeah. And I thought, I would like to be on the other side of that who created something <laughs> kids to want, you know. And uh, that was kind of how it started out as uh, another project I own. And I have four or five books out. But it's still hard to, you know, still hard to make it make money, you know, because you need a big, big company, a big publisher behind you, Simon Schuster or Little Brown or scholastic or something and you know the uh, rejection letters are, are building up but i still believe i have some special there so i'll keep working on it you know good for you i think you should don't give up and i know you're so experienced but do you ever experience writer's block and how do you deal with that yeah um well as uh, not predominantly you know writing for me is something i i'm still weaning i'm still learning um as a, as a creator, uh, you know, as a guy who does the artwork, um, sometimes you're not feeling it, right? And you got to go away from it, but you got, you know, the deadline, it's deadline connected. So you have to have your stuff done. Um, and, and holidays, you know, the books still have to be on the shelf on the holidays. So you don't really, that's the thing about uh, when you're working in comics. I remember meeting one of the guys I looked up to when I was in my teens and he said, you know, if you're going to get married, get married before you get in comics. Cause once you get into comics, you're going to get married to comics, you know? <laughs> and, and yeah. And you know, this, yeah, I remember going on vacation with my my kids and my wife and, you know, uh, bringing artwork, having to draw on, on the oh. beach, you know, and sitting in a, a chair with a bottle of ink, you know, and they're at the beach enjoying themselves. But I had a, I, and you can't say no, if you say no, you might not get the call again. So that, that plays a role in it, too. I understand. And have you ever had a fan recognize you and approach you? And what's your most memorable fan interaction you ever had? <laughs> you know, this is really funny because just the other day I was at a Honda. I, I bought a, a 2024 Honda CRV, and uh, the first the first um, oil change was up. So I went into the Honda dealer service, uh, the service center, and there was a, a woman named Becca who who said to me, um, you know, she sat me down and, and then I see pictures of her little kid. She had a four-year-old boy named Nicholas and a little girl. And I said, you know, I do a children's book. I said, I'll give you my card. Maybe you can take a look at the website, get a kick. There's things for kids to do on a website. She, I said, I'm a comic book artist. About 20 minutes later, I'm sitting in the waiting room and this guy walks in and he says, Mr. McKenna, Mr. McKenna. And I said, yeah. He goes, you're a comic book artist? He goes, I know who you are. He goes, I read comics. Oh. You know? This just happened two days ago. It was, <laughs> it was pretty cool, you know. Um, that is. And we started talking about comics. Um, that ha that happened. It happens so, because uh, of the artwork. The name is right. My face is is recognizable because I'm drawing superheroes. Um, mm -hmm. But I was at a. Uh, I went into an EBX electronic boutique store one day, and the, and the cashier said to me, "You're Mark McKenna, aren't you?" And I thought, "How do you know that?" He goes, "I've seen you at Comic Cons." And I've been. I, he, he went to Comic Cons, and he must have seen me at a show. So I thought that was kind of cool. Did I lose oh, you? You're uh, back now. <laughs> oh, did I go out? Sorry. Just a little bit, not too bad. But that's pretty cool. Uh, so, I have another one other story, if I could. If I tell sure, you. of course. Uh, about eight, ten years ago, we went to go see Spider-Man on Broadway. It was called Turn Off, Turn Off the Dark or whatever. I really didn't want to go see Spider-Man on Broadway, but my wife bought me tickets to go see it. And um, I brought prints, Spider-Man prints, to give to Broadway for kids. 
the Broadway for Kids is like uh, they were donating artwork and uh, auctioning it, and then kids that don't get a chance to go to Broadway would then get a chance to have some, you know, support there. So I right. bought a couple of Spider-Man prints, and I we were sitting outside of the um, Broadway, the show, and I, I talked to one of the ushers and said that I brought art prints to donate to the cause from the privileged kids. And the guy says, "Let me bring the um, let me bring the uh, floor manager over to you." So the floor manager comes over and said, okay, this is great. Thank you so much. Would you like to meet Spider-Man at the end of the show? <gasps> this is the kid that's on stage, you know? Mm -hmm. So I said, sure. <laughs> and um, as soon as the show ended, the guy was right next to me. He goes, follow me. So uh, the wife and I get in an elevator. We go down a floor to the VIP room. And the guy was just on stage. Spider-Man pops right around the corner <laughs> with, his, with his mask off and says, hi. I said, well, my name is Mark McKenna. I work on comics. I donated this artwork and he goes, I know who you are. I collect comics, you know, and uh, he hugs me, you know, and I thought this oh. was, my wife was like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. He's a handsome guy. He was a handsome guy. My wife loved him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's pretty cool. It's kind of, you know, mirroring, you know, life and reality and comics was, all in, yeah. came together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's also was, was other cool. He was a. Uh, I don't know if you're into Taylor Swift, but he was uh, played her boyfriend. His name was uh, Reeve Carney. Reeve Carney was uh, Taylor Swift's boyfriend in one of her earlier uh, videos. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, I love her work. I think she's very talented. <laughs> yeah, they're, we're surrounded by her. <laughs> hey, can I ask you, do you interact with your fans and do their opinions or ideas inflect or impact your work and what you write? I don't know if I worded that right. You know uh, what I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I am open to suggestions. I'm not one of those guys that thinks I, I'm, I'm, it's my way or the highway. You know, I'm, <laughs> right. I, I'm, I, I actually encourage people to come up with ideas. Um, I'm doing a, a I'm going to be de developing a book of short stories from my monkey character. It's gonna. Oh, cool. I'm gonna call it peels and all banana peels. And oh, all. that's so cute. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I love you know, it. I have about 48 or 50 something pages of short stories, and I want to get it around 70, 80 pages so I can have a nice, solid hardcover of short stories. Um, so I'm always encouraging friends to uh, write or draw stories for me. The only trick with that, of course, is that you have to create a work for hire uh, contract with them because if Banana Tail ever became the next, you know, Blues Clues or Barbie. Everybody would want a piece, of, you know, a piece of flesh from that, you know. Oh, I so, see. Right. Yeah. So it's a little tricky with that stuff. But I, you know, right at, the, at this point in my life, it's um, it's not that not that involved yet. So. Okay. Good to know. Do you have a favorite step in the process of, you know, from penciling to inking to writing? What's your favorite part of bringing a comic book to life? So I've predominantly been an inker for most okay. of my career. Um, mm -hmm. I do get a chance occasionally to stretch out and do a cover or, um, you know, pinups or commissions like that. <clears throat> but I, I find that uh, if I have somebody who could just lay out the, fundamental basics of a figure or a page, then I can go in and elaborate on it. So my imagination starts, back. At, that, starts at that point. It's not it's not uh, from a blank page looking at it going, now what am I going to do? You know, right. I, need to, I almost need a little hand holding to that point, and then I'm good with that. But, you know, I've, uh, on my website it says, you know, 12,000 pages, uh, and I think I have almost a 1,000 credits in comics uh, over the years, because I haven't updated that in a while, but uh, it, it adds up. But, you know, I have the quart bottle of ink, you know, and uh, oh. I have a little taped ink bottle next to my uh, next to my uh, couch. I put my feet up on a table and I, that's how I work, even though I have a giant 48 inch art table. Um, I find putting on really bad movies <laughs> is, is the best medicine for working because you don't have to look up, you know, you just you just sit there and just listen while you're working. Um, That's yeah. awesome. Or a movie you've seen so many times, you already know the next line before it's spoken. <laughs> yeah, I have, I love those movies actually. I was well, just watching stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm imagining you're young, but uh, I was watching uh, 
Far and Away with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman the other day. And then I watched The Officer and the Gentleman from 1982. Wow. Getting into some nostalgic stuff. Um, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's uh, that if it's an action movie, I'm screwed, though, because there's no <laughs> talk. There's a lot of fighting, you know. Right. Well, what's the last comic you read? And would you recommend it? The last comic I read. Hmm. It's a good question. I was I was reading the Walking Dead stuff for a while. Um, you you familiar with the Walking Dead, right? Yes, I actually read the first ten of the comics, and then after it, it kind of lost my interest. I didn't think it was as well written. It kind of veered mm -hmm. off. What's your opinion? Uh, I the guy who created uh, the Walking Dead is his um. One of the guys that works with him, his name is uh, Sean Kirkham. He uh, he sent me the the, Bi the two Bibles of the Walking Dead. So I had one to fifty, and then uh, fifty one to hundred. Yeah, it's a huge huge undertaking to read them. I read some of them, um, but my comic reading has really dropped off uh, to a point that. Um, I, I don't even remember the first co last comic I wrote. The, when I talk about The Walking Dead, I'm talking about a few years ago. Right now, I'm into uh, I'm reading books. Um, I just finished. Um, well, uh, I don't even know what I just finished, but I'm working on Rod Serling, who created The Twilight Zone. I met his daughter at a comic con, and oh, cool. uh, yeah, and Rod Serling is uh, I was a big fan of his his uh, Twilight Zones back in the 70s and 80s and meeting his daughter was cool so she wrote a um a book about her father you know and i i'm reading that right now i like and i like bios i mm -hmm. uh i want to read henry winkler you know the fonz i was interested in reading that um you know i'm into the bios right now and i like horror books too i'm a big clive barker or stephen king fan too oh nice so am i i love stephen king books and i just read fairy tale his latest which really isn't much of a horror it's more of a fantasy book and i loved it you know, there's another book called Fairy Tales that I read back in the uh, late 80s, which was a cool book. I mean, I started trying to look it up in Amazon, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of books named Fairy Tales, you know. Um, right. It's not, just not Stephen King. <laughs> right. You know, that's interesting because there is a recurring theme, I think, in comics of the unknown or trying to solve an intriguing mystery. Do you have a mystery or unanswered question that you would just love to explore in your work? Hmm. Give me a little bit more. Well, is there something that you fear that you may never know the answer Ooh. to, but you could solve it? in your own way with your own comic? I don't know if I have an answer for that. That's, uh, mm -hmm. that, that's a little past where I'm, my head goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was just curious. No. Did you have a mentor as you were learning how to better your comics and your inking, someone you looked up to? Yeah, uh, John Romita Sr. was the uh, art director at Marvel uh, back in the uh, 80s. And um, I was reading Spider-Man by John Romita in the back of my uh, parents' station wagon at the movie theater, at the drive-in movie, when I was in my teens. And um, he's the guy who called me and offered me a job at Marvel in 1985, actually originally in 1984. Um, and I couldn't believe he was calling me and offered me a job. You know, guys, comics I'm reading, and now he's calling me and offering me a job. Very surreal. Um, right. But I, I actually said no to him the first time because the uh, art correct, it would have been working in the art corrections program as a, kind of an intern. Mm -hmm. But it was at the time, I think it was $4.50 an hour. And uh, I was living out in Long Island. I'm a Long Island kid. And my commuting uh, cost would have been my whole paycheck every week. Oh, and, no. <laughs> and, yeah. And I, I told them, I said, I can't afford it. Um, he said, I'll keep your name on this list if another opportunity happens. And he called me uh, three, two, two more times. The third time I explained to him that um, I needed more than what the page, the uh, hourly rate would entail. And he said, how about if I can get you assisting other artists? I said, that Ooh. would be it. Then they would pay you a percentage of their their rate. 
So if you were getting $150 a page, you get 20% of their rate, you get 30 bucks. Um, so I said yes, and then from then in, then on, I never looked back. I, I worked at Marvel for almost a little under two years, and then I brought my artwork samples to DC Comics, which is about 20 blocks away. It's DC is Batman and Superman. And uh, that's when things opened up for me because DC Comics <clears throat> called me up next day and offered me uh, a contract. Uh, and uh, benefits and medical and <clears throat> everything went great from there. Oh, that's great. So if you could impart wisdom on upcoming aspiring artists, what would your wisdom be for them? Uh, don't just because your mom thinks you're the best artist doesn't mean <laughs> that you are. Uh, <laughs> okay. Go to if you want to be a comic artist, you got to go to comic cons. You got to meet artists like myself, show them samples. Don't show me what you drew on a napkin the morning before, or um, <laughs> that, that's it. they're out there. And I really, you know, I, yeah, there's people that go look what I did, you know. Um, but <clears throat> I've done a lot of portfolio reviews in my in my time. And the other thing is, um, you know, show your artwork in the format that it's intended to be. You know, don't just draw a big face on a page and go look what I could do. You got to be able to storytell. You have to be able to you know, read your story, uh, look at look at the pictures and be able to understand what's going on in the story, not necessarily with text, you know, or script. Um, uh, I met one guy who uh, I was at a New York Comic Con, uh, this had to be 20 something years ago. And uh, my, I did an hour portfolio review. When I got up to leave, this guy got up with me, uh, got off the line and followed me back to my table. And I said, what, what are you doing? He goes, Is somebody following you know, me that's going to do a review. And he said, I want you to see my work. So I went and I looked at his stuff. I go, holy smokes, you're great. You know, you get, you might get one out of 30 that is potentially there. Right. And his stuff was fantastic. And I said, I'm going to bring your stuff to, I was at the time I was doing the Punisher at Marvel. And um, I said, can I bring your samples to my editor? And he said, yeah, I would love that, you know. And uh, I brought him in and the editor didn't get it. I was like, and I, a lot of times editors are not artists and they, they don't know how to judge what good art is. They just know something doesn't look good or something looks good. Um, so the editor just said, I see this stuff all the time. And I'm like, no, you, I, I think you, you're wrong, you know? So he passed on them. But within a year, the guy took off. He was doing Pre Predator Batman for DC Comics. Oh, wow. His name, his name, I remember his name forever. It's Rodolfo DiMaggio. And, um, he was doing. He actually left comics to do storyboards for film. Uh, I guess he got bored with comics after a while, but he made his mark and then left. You know, and that's one of those rare, rare birds that you know. You, you, you don't, there was not enough of those kind of guys. You know. Yeah, I'm glad he didn't give up, especially with that much talent. Right. So my last question is: I have to know because you've worked for both, and I hear this question constantly. Marvel or DC? What do you answer? Uh, DC treated their uh, freelancers better. Um, when I was on contract at DC, uh, I would get Christmas cards. I got Christmas presents. Uh, they put a flyer out every month with uh, what's coming and going at DC Comics. Uh, I was brought into the offices at one point by the editor in chief, who uh, I, I wrote a letter. They were trying to uh, increase the uh, royalty scheme for inkers. So, um, it, so the, the way it used to be set up is you get a, a percentage of the cover price. So for, for example, um, a writer would get 1.5% of the cover. If it's, if it's a four, $4 book, you get 1.5% of that, you know, they get three, uh, four or five, five and a half cents a book or whatever it is. Um, the pencilers, the guys who drew the pencil work would get 1% and the inkers getting 0.6. So they brought me to the office and said that my letter was instrumental for getting the inkers up to 1.0. So uh, I feel nice. pretty good about that. Yeah. And then Marvel and DC were both on par with the same 1%. So DC was always better with that stuff. Marvel always was number one and DC was always trying harder, kind of like Hertz and, Hertz and Avis rent a car, you know, <laughs> one is number one is a better one. The other guy's trying harder. Um, but everybody, but I grew up a Marvel baby, a uh, zombie. I was reading Spider-Man. I never read Batman. I was reading The Silver Surfer and 
you know, all the all the, the Hulk and Daredevil left stuff. So my heart lied with Marvel anyhow, you know, even though DC treated us better. And today I'm not even sure. I, you know, it's been a while since I've done mainstream stuff. So couldn't tell you if that's true today, though. Yeah, it's growing. It's different. There, You have a lot of these indie comic companies that have grown and done well and give opportunities for all different kinds of storytelling, which I appreciate. It's fun. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you read comics? I love comics. Yes. Yeah. I'm a huge Batman fan. It's like old school, but I love Batman. I love Batgirl. So, yeah. So Anyways. you might notice I worked on a Batgirl miniseries back, I don't know. Did you? Back in the early 2000s. <clears throat> yeah, I think I can't remember the name of it though. It was Fortune Miniseries. I did two two issues of that. I also worked on Detective, which is the original Batman book from 1938 or whatever it is. I did wow. issues seven, 769 to 775. So, oh. yeah, that's exciting that's so for me. Cool. Yes, yeah. it is. I, I mean, you know, I admire you. I was so excited when I heard that I got to talk to you. So this is wow. an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you for reaching out to me, too. Yeah, and I know our monsters are going to enjoy getting to know the artists behind the new NFT. So thank you so much for that and sharing who you are and a little bit of your story. And we're looking forward to seeing how that goes. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah, and reach out to me uh, at some point. And I'll, I'll hook you up with some books. Oh, thank you so much. My pleasure. Now, don't miss out on the new limited edition games farms. They are on sale right now. They are with the exclusive art by the Dream Team, Mr. McKenna, Jay DeFoy, and Ross Campbell. And they are pumping out 50% farms every week to keep your wallets happy. So head on over to the sale page and I'll throw the link up right here down below. And you can buy as many as you want right now within that limited release. I think we put a thousand out and we've already met our one week goal, no, our one month goal within the first two weeks. So those are selling great. Okay. So check them out. And I am so happy guys that you came today to hang out with me. And I just appreciate your time. Thanks for helping me keep it pink. And guys, have a great week. I will see you here next Monday. Bye, guys.